Hi everyone, I am Dr. Aurora Elmore, the Cooperative Institute Manager for NOAA Ocean Exploration. Thank you very much for joining us today for NOAA's Science Seminar. This is the fifth webinar in a six-part series about NOAA's Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute, also known as OECI. Throughout the webinars, we'll meet the OECI team and hear about their exciting projects in deep sea exploration. The OECI is a partnership between NOAA, the University of Rhode Island, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, University of Southern Mississippi, University of New Hampshire, and the nonprofit Ocean Exploration Trust. For some general information before we get going today, this presentation is being recorded and will be posted with closed captioning shortly after the webinar. Live closed captioning is available now and the link has been posted in the YouTube description. We encourage audience questions to come in throughout the presentation. You'll be able to ask those questions live in the YouTube chat box, but you must be signed into a YouTube account in order to do so. For those of you with a NOAA.gov email address, in order to ask a question, you'll need to either sign into YouTube with your personal email address, or you can email your questions to OECI underscore questions at URI.edu. Thanks, Aurora. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Costell. I'm the Director of Research Communications at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I'm joining you today from the research vessel Atlantis, where it's a balmy 50 degrees or so in the main lab. The ship is the support ship of the human-occupied submersible Alvin. Uh, Hui operates Alvin as part of the National Deep Submergence Facility that also includes the remotely operated vehicle Jason and the autonomous underwater vehicle Sentry, which both of which are all three of which we operate on behalf of the entire uh, oceanographic community. Some of you may have heard that we recently had to halt sea trials of Alvin on our way to taking it to its new maximum depth of 6,500 meters. The challenges I think that the, that the Alvin team faces uh, really underscores how incredibly difficult it is to explore the deep ocean, no matter how easy they and the rest of the oceanographic community may make it appear. Um, as one of our nav sea observers pointed out the other day traveling to a place like the the, the deep ocean that's so hostile to, to human life and to the things that we build and put into it it's probably the most non-routine routine thing that we can do i really couldn't agree more i think that 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 puts a, a fine point on on how, how challenging it is but i think it also underscores the importance of the oeci and its ability to bring such a wide spectrum of scientific engineering and operational expertise to focus on the task of better understanding the marine environment that's right at our nation's doorstep. Um, but instead of, of listening to a communications person blather on about this, I'm going to turn things over to somebody who actually knows a thing or two about this, uh, who is deputy director and vice president for, uh, for science and engineering is Rick Murray, and he's going to come on now to tell you a little bit more about what Huey brings to the OECI table. Rick? Thanks a lot, Ken. And yeah, I'm coming to you all from my, my office here at Woods Hole Oceanographic. It's nowhere near as exciting as being on board the Atlantis, and I wish I was out there with you, uh, Ken. Yeah, so here I am from uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic here on site in uh, Falmouth, Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Uh, Huey is the world's largest independent oceanographic a research institution. We have about a thousand employees and roughly at any given time, 800 different active research projects uh, that are active at all scales, ranging from tens of millions of dollars down to tens of thousands of dollars, as our science and engineering is at all scale and all scope. In addition to the National Deep Submergence Facility, we operate several other National Science Foundation sponsored national facilities, including National Ocean Science Accelerator Mass Spec Facility, Northeast National Ion Microprobe, as well as the Ocean Bottom Seismometer Instrument Center, uh, to just name a few. Uh, of course, our long-term partnership with agencies such as NSF, the Office of Naval Research, and of course, NOAA, is critical to uh, our success and our nation's success in ocean science and engineering uh, overall. And as you can see here in this lovely aerial photo of our 
of our working peer. We operate two of the academic fleets, the national academic fleets, large research vessels, the Atlantis and the Neil Armstrong, as well as the coastal research vessel Tioga and many, many small boats as well. With all this access and with all these facilities comes a significant role in ensuring access to the sea for thousands of researchers over the years, Hui people as well as from elsewhere all around the world. And this, this access has created an unbroken line of experience and hard-won knowledge about how to work safely and effectively on and in the ocean. And as Ken pointed out, the ocean is indeed a hostile environment and to, to do it safely uh, is, is a challenge uh, indeed. So in addition to supporting ocean science, we have over the life of the institution made significant contributions to ocean engineering and to the development of new technologies to explore the ocean, one of which you'll hear about shortly from our colleagues. Working in the ocean is challenging, as I've said, and it requires a lot of very high caliber, detailed engineering and fabrication. This hallmark was born of a long commitment to innovation and to putting scientists and engineers together to solve difficult problems. The intersection of that science and engineering is one of the things that makes HUI strong, makes other academic institutions strong, and also speaks very clearly to the successes of the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. This intersection of en engineering and science not only results in new tools, but often creates new questions that no one had ever thought to ask before because they couldn't be measured before. In terms of our personnel, in addition to leading scientists and established engineers, we are partners with Massachusetts Institution of Technology, MIT, in training the next generation of leadership in ocean science and engineering policy and increasingly our outreach through the MIT HUI Joint Program in Ocean Science uh, and Engineering. So I'm saying all this to you now, not so much to talk about HUI, but to make the point that none of this would have been possible without close collaboration close collaboration and cooperation with a list of partners, both institutions and individuals that's far too long to name and stretches through decades. That fact is fundamental to why the OECI uh, itself was formed. So, so far, even though we're in year two or three, this new collaboration has already borne remarkable fruit. Many of you have already seen in some previous shows what Mizobot and Nereid Under Ice were able to accomplish thanks to our friends at the Ocean Exploration Trust. And now we're looking forward to Julie Huber from Woods Hole, her upcoming Ring of Fire expedition on the Falcor. As one of our own OET colleagues said during last month's seminar, we are stronger together. And each of the members brings a unique capability that makes us all more effective, challenge us, challenges us all as well, and better able to tackle um, the opportunities that the ocean presents and the uh, difficulties that it presents to pursuing this um, exploration goals, which is exactly what we hope the Cooperative Institute would do, bringing together all these different uh, disparate sources, different expertise, uh, and different uh, personnel. So back to you, Ken, back out at sea and uh, away from my office here. <laughs> Back out at sea, tied up at the pier in, in San Juan. Uh, well, well, good you know, enough. The, 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 <laughs> the expedition uh, we're going to hear about in a moment uh, from Tim and Casey, you know, it struck me that it, as one of the earliest uh, expeditions funded by OECI, right out of the gate, had significant NASA involvement. And I was wondering if you could touch on the, the potential for OEC to, OECI to also expand beyond the, you know, the CI membership to... Uh, strengthen interagency partnerships. Yeah, sure. Um, building, developing, ideating, creating all this uh, technology and asking the questions that drive the technology and answering the questions that the technology enables us to uh, comes from many different sources. In addition to NOAA, we work closely with the National Science Foundation, which, as I said, funds the National Deep Submergence Facility as well as other agencies. We work with the Office of Naval Research, uh, NASA, you know, exploring our own planet while we're also exploring other planets. We can use our own planet as a, essentially a test facility for what NASA might be trying to do on other planets eventually. Uh, and of course, the pursuit of basic science, which is NSF's mission. And I used to work there, as you know, uh, NOAA with exploration here, 
Office of Naval Research, charged with national defense and security, and NASA with basic science and exploration. All of those agencies have interests in technology. They all are interested in, you know, better um, battery power, better visibility, better communications, more autonomy. Uh, all these different goals and motivations coalesce and a, a group, uh, if you will, a group like OECI is a great place to bring it all together. That's great. Thanks very much. All right. Next, I'd like to introduce Casey Machado. Um, Casey is a research engineer here at Hui, who I've had the, the, the pleasure of sailing with on a, on a, on a previous Hadel expedition. Uh, she's also the new operations manager at Hui's Automated Vehicle and Sensor Technology Facility with the, the great acronym, acronym of AVAST. Um, you'll hear about that more, more about that shortly. Uh, but some of you may remember Casey from her tour that she gave of Near It Under Ice vehicle during the seminar in September. And that focused on, uh, that seminar focused on the expedition that was just wrapping up aboard EV Nautilus at the time. Today, Co uh, Casey's gonna reprise her role as tour guide and give us a look at the new full ocean depth capable autonomous underwater vehicle Orpheus, which she helped deploy, design and deploy from Okeanos Explorer earlier this year. And after that, after Casey, we'll hear from Hui biologist Tim Shank about some of the results from that mission. But first, why don't you take it away, Casey? Great, thank you, Ken. Uh, so yeah, as Ken said, I'm uh, here sitting in a uh, research facility, Avast, and uh, beside me is uh, the Orpheus uh, vehicle, which I can take you on a quick uh, walkthrough of. We designed Orpheus to be a compact, uh, cost-effective uh, solution, and we actually have two identical uh, copies of this vehicle, which we can use. And it is full ocean depth rated, so we can explore anywhere in the ocean. And um, at the very front of it here, you can see there's a glass sphere underneath. Uh, this glass sphere houses all of the batteries and the electronics, uh, the brains of the vehicle itself. And right in the foreground there is also the camera that it uses to do its uh, visual-based navigation called terrain relative navigation. And Tim will talk a little bit more about that and um, how the vehicle design was tied into uh, our colleagues over at uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory as well in that development. But Orpheus basically navigates by looking at the seafloor and uh, seeing how far it has gone uh, by looking. So you can see slung underneath there in the undercarriage are a bunch of LED lights to illuminate the seafloor, that open bay in the uh, center uh, above uh, is basically where we put any of our science payload, mission specific things, be they sediment samplers or eDNA samplers, um, anything can go in there. So it's designed to basically be a, a pickup truck to bring things to the deep ocean. Um, and then you can see along the side also, there are uh, thrusters, there's four thrusters. Uh, we have sort of fore and aft thrust and vertical thrust that allow us to uh, drive around Pretty slow pace, but um, it's uh, power efficient and lets us sort of maximize our exploration there. And um, up on the top, uh, you can see there's a, a bale for lifting it out of the water, as well as these uh, launch and recovery beacons there. The uh, one with the sort of beige top is a GPS iridium beacon that will send us an email when Orpheus comes back to the surface with its GPS position, which lets us find it. Uh, we use that to a uh, great effect aboard uh, the Okeanos on our cruise this past spring. And then um, Behind that is a strobe flasher, so uh, if all else fails, we can see Orpheus blinking little light uh, out on the surface there. So that is a, a quick uh, rundown of uh, the whole vehicle itself. And again, we have two of these uh, already, and as Tim will speak to our vision in the future, we wanted them to be uh, small and accessible so that we can uh, hopefully expand our fleet of these vehicles in the future. Very small on a very big ocean. Um, so I mentioned that you're you're in Avast in the new Quisset Research Facility building on uh, Hui's Quisset campus, and it's brand new. It you know, opened this this summer, um, so the folks who are tuning in probably might not know what Avast is all about. Can you give us a little bit of background on that. Yeah, um, I just started my role as operations manager uh, here in Avast, uh, the end of the summer here, and it's a, a really exciting new way that uh, Hui is implementing to 
get projects to innovate and accelerate uh, and collaborate and work together. So Vast is a space in which any project at Hui um, can have space here. We provide resources for them like test tanks or uh, instrumentation tests. We have pressure test facilities, we have temperature chambers, um, and we also maintain uh, Dunkworks, which is a uh, sort of advanced fabrication and prototype facility as well here. So the idea behind Avast was to put all of the resources and tools right at the fingertips of uh, anyone who has new innovative ideas and to help them um, collaborate and accelerate through those so we can really push the boundaries of not only what we're doing technologically, but also uh, how we're doing it. That's great. Um, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions and you're watching on uh, whatever channel you're, you're wa watching on, if you type your questions into the comments, they'll appear uh, for us and we'll, we'll get to those later in the, uh, in the Q&A session. Um, next, I'd like to introduce the, 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 the person who helped dream up the idea of Orpheus and who, along with Casey, has been spearheading its development for the past five years or, show, or so. Many of you know Tim. Uh, Tim Shank is a deep sea biologist and an associate scientist here at Hui with more than 20 years of experience. He's studying life at hydrothermal vents, cold seeps, on sea mounts, among stands of deep water coral, probably several other places in the ocean I'm forgetting. Um, in May, he led a tech demo mission aboard Okeanos Explorer that was funded by OECI to test the capabilities of Orpheus and to give Eurydice the, its, its twin, its first taste of salt water. So I, I'm gonna let Tim tell you uh, about all of that. Tim, why don't you take it away? Hey, thank you so much, Ken, uh, appreciate it. And uh, thank you everyone for joining too. It's a great privilege and pleasure to be here to speak with you and share the results of our mission that was uh, five months ago now. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to give you some of the highlights, the results of that, of that cruise uh, in pretty brief order. Um, if we go to the first slide, uh, we'll be able to see here. So we had a 2021 in, in May cruise, really uh, taking out these two vehicles. As Ken said, you see them here, uh, one on the top image being deployed over the side and the other one in the water. And we were doing this work, um, this field testing program uh, on the Florida uh, plateau. Uh, so we were, you know, venturing into, you know, almost a kilometer depth or so uh, to expand the, the technology of these vehicles and test them. And so go to the next slide, I have a, a brief summary quickly. And I just wanna highlight some of the things that we discovered and learned about. Uh, we were, first of all, I wanna say we were on the Okeanos Explorer, which was a fantastic vessel for us. And we, over a, a short, less than two week period, uh, we had uh, seven Orpheus dives uh, and it's twin Eurydice, as Ken mentioned, it was also had one dive. Um, through these dives, these are really our first dives uh, I'm looking at Casey over here, but the, we had a couple, we had two cruises prior to this, and I think we had a total of three dives. So not much time in the water with the vehicles, given weather and other constraints. But anyway, this was our first real dive, you know, uh, engineering mission, if you will. And we covered uh, 30 kilometers of seafloor with 25 hours uh, of time. Uh, we were, we had those dives that ventured down to 866 meters. Uh, again, People often say to us, you know, how come you don't go to 6,000 or 2,000 meters? You know, the goal here is to get the core vehicle functioning and to test the core vehicle and learn from it and what we've got to do to advance um, to operations. And so we don't really care. It's agnostic how deep we really go, right? It was nice to squeeze things a bit, but so 800 and so meters were what we were shooting for and that was fine. Go back to that slide, please. and and and. I'll just say we had a payload on board. We had a, a navigation camera, a terrain relative navigation camera that, that Casey mentioned. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second, but also a 4K HD camera uh, looking downward. We had a CTD on board and we had an in-situ chemical sensor that I've been working on for the last, I don't know, two years or so. Um, and I'll talk more about that too. But we ended up surveying two coral mounds on the Blake Plateau. We discovered a uh, distribution of, uh, of new corals on the mounds had not been investigated before. Uh, ended up with over 700 gigabytes of, of really high resolution video. What's most important, uh, I think, for us is that we demonstrated really reliable autonomous control near and on the bottom. You know, we were, it's the first time we got a chance to really test heading and altitude and the ability to, to land the vehicle. You know, autonomous underwater vehicles don't really want to touch bottom. 
uh, in most cases. I can't think of one that wants to do that, but this one does. This one wants to go survey an area and then land on the bottom and do additional work. So I love that about this vehicle. So we demonstrated that control in a, in a fantastic way. And not only the, that control, but also being able to run tightly scripted missions. So, you know, when you teach a, a, an AUV to sort of to learn how to walk, you know, you have to mow the grass on the seafloor, if you will. We survey the seafloor and, and grid lines and we counter, have counter lines and all that kind of thing. And, and you want to see it can do that at different altitudes it can, in, in changing altitudes. It can turn on a dime. And this vehicle did that. It followed the missions perfectly, which is really fantastic. And so I feel like sort of the, the highlights of the cruise can stop there, but there's actually a, a, quite a bit more. Um, you know, we were able to acquire video from that navigation camera that really is advancing our software development and being able to use that uh, camera system to navigate on the seafloor. Um, so we also demonstrated the use of this Institute chemical sensor, which I'm really excited about. And I'll talk more about that in a second. And then lastly on that slide, I don't know if it's still there, but um, yeah, um, I want to fully mention that we demonstrated the Okeanos Explorer as a highly capable platform for AUV operations. That, that ship, that NOAA ship of ocean exploration has really been used really with ROVs, remotely operated vehicles. And, and so we were excited to use it. And I, I was really surprised at how well we integrated our group into their group and our mission and how our cadence, our rhythm, our mode of exploration, if you will, for the vehicle was just, we were, we synced as a team which is really amazing. And we're really looking forward to go back, going back out with the, on the Okeanos. If we go to the next slide, I think I will start highlighting the, the highlights of the, of the chemical sensor. Um, this is an autonomous sensor. It's circled there in, in yellow on the side of the vehicle. It can detect a variety of chemical species. So hydrogen sulfide, uh, HS minus, iron sulfides, all kinds of different reduced chemical species but also oxygen and peroxide, manganese and organics. And it's been, I've been working with this sensor for 20 years now almost, used it on Alvin when it, when it weighed 60 or 75 pounds, and now it's down to less than 10 pounds. But it has an eight day endurance for logging uh, in situ. Um, and what was really fantastic was after the dive, we got, we were able to download the data and send it right to a lab in New Jersey who analyzed that data and showed us where we had spikes of different temperatures and changes sorry, not temperatures, but chemical species and those changes. And then we took those times that they told us there were these spikes in hydrogen sulfide or other things. And we, next slide, mapped them onto our three-dimensional seafloor reconstructions. We make mosaics from the Orpheus downlooking video. And what you're seeing here on this slide is 25 meter diagonal stretch here. That's a single line of Orpheus over the seafloor. So that's a swath of the camera system. And you can see that white circle where this the vehicle went over a hydrocarbon seep. And we detected that using that in-situ chemical sensor. So that was a real thrill because that's one of the things we really want to do in the Hadal zone. We really, scientists believe there are fluids coming out of the seafloor at 8,000 meters, 9,000 meters, 10,000 meters. And this is the instrument that can allow us to discover those, explore those and conduct research. So we're super excited about that. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I want to, highlight something else that happened on the cruise and really advancing this technology of terrain relative navigation, working closely with our partners at, at Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA, the two major engineers there, just um, fantastic result. So we were able to validate the use of this navigation system on autonomous vehicles um, on this cruise. And so if we roll the video, you'll see this is the deck of the ship, the vehicle's taking off the deck these green dots are unique features on the deck of the ship that the software is identifying and it tracks those and follows those and constructs a network of these green dots, if you will, as features on the seafloor. And as we, as we roll along the seafloor with the vehicle, it connects all these dots and basically makes a feature map for us, which is simply amazing because at, at, at 10,000 meters full ocean depth, there's little we can do in the traditional way of acoustic navigation. We had to come up with a new system of navigation for such a vehicle as this, where we want it to cover kilometers and kilometers of seafloor. Here you see it's even, there's me taking video of the vehicle and the side of the ship identifying all those unique characteristics. And this is software developed at, at JPL NASA um, that we're typically taking advantage of their, their work. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see it actually working on the seafloor. 
here we are in situ, which is really remarkable. Um, as you see it tracking, this is just ripples on that on the Blake Plateau off of Florida. And you can see that once in a while, these, these green dots are, are just particles in the water column. And they're not on the seafloor. And it detects them, but then it filters them out and just keeps those that are on the seafloor. So this is really going to advance seafloor mapping. What we plan to do is combine this with the visual camera data that we have to make three-dimensional seafloor maps, if you will, to centimeter or even millimeter scale. And so we're super excited about this. And all this is coming about because of our partnerships, the kind of thing that the OECI really wants to see happen is integrating these partnerships together. If we go to the next slide. Um, and this comes you know, straight out of um, the work that NASA has been doing with the Mars rover. And you can see here, there's a map at the top of the screen that shows you the landing site in the Gerizo crater on Mars. Um, it, 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 it was the same sort of software they used that we we're using on the Orpheus vehicles. As that rover approached Mars, it took overlapping pictures of the surface. It, it con constructed a mosaic of those images. It determined what was elevated high, that's in there, shown in the red here in the bottom image, and what was relatively flat and safe to land on, that's in blue. And you can see the arrow where they actually landed the rover, you know, in the midst of all this chaotic terrain, they put it on a nice blue spot. Well, it's amazing that we're able to have uh, Russell Smith, the, one of the engineers um, that has been developing this software, and next slide please, has actually been working with um, Ingenuity, the Mars helicopter, uh, as, an, as an engineer on that vehicle. And it's amazing that the Orpheus vehicle, you know, at 10,000 meters depth will be operating very similarly as the Mars helicopter does. The Mars helicopter is designed to come out uh, uh, up off the, the the surface of the, of, the, of the planet and traverse over the, the surface, taking imagery, constructing those, um, those, putting those green dots together, if you will, to make that terrain map uh, that the rover will then therefore use to navigate over. And so it's very similar to what Orpheus is, is doing. So next slide, please. Some people might ask, why is, is, is JPL and NASA really interested in this? And it's really because I mean, they really originally approached us because we're deep sea uh, engineers and scientists and know how to work in the deep sea, and and and, and they really don't. It's it's really because there are six uh, ocean worlds in our solar system. These are ice-covered oceans that that are on the moons um, in our solar system. There's six here, and their relative size is shown. And you're looking at kilometers and kilometers of ice to get through. But once you get through that ice. We believe that mostly there's salty oceans there, you know, on Enceladus and in, in uh, Europa. Europa seems to be the real focus of where people are looking for trying to discover life. I mean, that's the goal. They want to do it. We like to do it. Um, and they're teaming up with us now because we together can advance getting to that moon and getting in the ocean and exploring it as we're doing with Orpheus and detecting things. So using it as an analog system. Uh, for going to ocean other ocean worlds. So next slide, please. This is a, a cutaway of what Europa moon would look like. Uh, you can see here, there's the ice covered, the gray part is the ice covered, the ice cover, sorry. Uh, it's, I believe it's around 10 to 12 kilometers thick. Um, you can see a very deep ocean is, I believe it's 80 kilometers deep, somewhat debatable, where ours is 11 kilometers deep. So as soon as you get past that ice, as soon as they drill through the ice with a solar drill, they will get into the water, will be under the pressure of the Hadal zone we have on our planet, which is 6,000 meters and deeper. And so there's an analog analogous thing here. There's an analog here for, work, for NASA working with us in the deep ocean to understand how they would explore other ocean worlds. And the premise here is that uh, for life being there is really that these moons, particularly Europa, has a hard core. Um, it has a saltwater ocean, has a hard core in the center, and through gravity with Jupiter, that core is squeezed, it's, it's pushed and pulled to the point where it creates heat. And that heat fractures that rock core that it has, allowing for seawater to go down through the cracks, get superheated by that heat, that, that heat source, and then it will rush up to the seafloor, much as the way that it happens on Earth at hydrothermal vents. So there's a belief, a strong belief, there's hydrothermal vents on, on moons like Europa. And so we're working with them to team up even how we would communicate vehicle to vehicle, back up to the surface lander, back to, to the Earth, and that kind of thing. We see these things developing. We see sensors being developed by NASA and put on Orpheus platforms 
to test them in the deep ocean. Just like NASA wants to find life on other, on other ocean worlds, we want to find life in the halo zone, little explored. And right now, we have no systematic way of doing exploration or research uh, in the halo zone. So anyway, next slide, please. Yeah, and so this is me to remind me to tell you that we've, we really, in order to, to do what we would do in ocean worlds, we've got to do it on Earth first. Uh, and so in doing so, we're going to open up over 47% of the depth of our ocean. It's not, area-wise, the halo zone is about the size of four Alaskas, you know, maybe half the size of Australia. So, but it represents half the depth. So half of the depth with animals that have novel adaptations have produced novel genes, uh, you know, so there's going to be a high capacity for discovering natural products, antibiotics, treatments of diseases, and those kinds of things in the halo zone. We're already seeing that already. And so that's one thing that we really want to go after scientifically, and these vehicles are going to allow us to do that. So the next slide, please, will show us sort of the, the next steps with our, with our group. And so one thing we really want to do, we've just proved, Casey and, and the gang have proved, we have a core functioning vehicle. And now it's time to make it be able to have full ocean depth capability and be able to operate at that depth. So we, got, we need some housing, some, we have to move some things around, but that's something we have a plan to do now. We really want to integrate the, the TRN odometry data into the vehicle control system. Right now it's independent in that software, but if we can, if we can integrate it in it for closed loop control, we can come to the point of developing algorithms that we can use that as the vehicle runs over the seafloor, it detects a certain chemical. It knows then that it can turn around and come back and come back to that same point and sit down on the seafloor. I mean, that's the real goal, right? To go over a hydrothermal vent, to go over a hydrocarbon seep, to go over a giant clam, stop and turn around, or communicate to another Orpheus vehicle, here's a clam over here at this coordinate, come sit down, let's do some more work. So going back to that, that slide, the, um, and so as we develop the core vehicle, you've seen that on the science side, I've been trying to really develop the in-situ chemical sensors. We want to look at environmental DNA on the, on the deep sea floor in the Hadal zone. We want to get the chemistry uh, to look for vents and seeps. Um, we, so as we build the core vehicle, I think it's incumbent that we make sure the vehicle is ready to integrate these kinds of sensors. And so we're pushing a lot of my colleagues, a lot of engineers that develop these kinds of things to, to bring those in and look at how we're going to modify them, working with JPL NASA to miniaturize these things as they do so well uh, to get them on the vehicles. Uh, of course, we want to produce more Orphei vehicle. They're, they're, they're really cost effective. Uh, they're less than 200K per vehicle. And so the idea is to have 10 or 12 of these being able to operate simultaneously below 6,000 meters in, in a given trench or somewhere uh, and communicating with each other uh, and then reporting back up to the surface. You know, and so once we have that group, we're ready to really go for uh, the real grand challenge and our vision is to go uh, around and do a global tour of exploration of the different trenches. We have reason to believe that trenches are vastly different uh, depending on where they are in the world and the diversity is really different and uh, that they're hubs of, of biodiversity and, and evolutionary novelty. And so it's really important for us to compare them. And so to get these vehicles out is gonna be, once they're fully developed, it's gonna be really exciting. So I'm gonna stop there and, and turn it back over to you, Ken. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm, I'm going to follow up with you in a second and get to some of the audience questions that have started coming in. And I want to remind everybody, you know, type your, your questions in the in the comments page of whatever you're you're watching us on. And it'll come filter through to me. Um, but first, before we get to your questions, um, you know, deploying and testing the individual vehicles as they did on Okeanos Explorer is only the start of that a much broader vision that Tim outlined for the future of autonomous exploration and research in the Hadal Zone. And we have a short video that Tim and Casey helped us put together that kind of visualizes that. I want to, we'll watch that first and then come back to your questions. So cue that up.
Okay, well, I think we're having a little bit of trouble playing the uh, the sound on that. Um, let's let's go to some questions. If uh, if Tim and Casey are still there, I don't see them on my screen. There we go. Maybe there they are. Okay. Um, so we've we've had a, a a couple of questions come in from 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 Josh, um, and. Uh, to, to my folks behind the scenes, Ryan, you don't have to put this the first one up in its entirety. It's it's somewhat long, but um, Josh asks, you know, why? And you, you you touched on this a little bit already, Tim, but I think it bears repeating. Why use visual feedback for navigating instead of you know more traditional navigation um, techniques like using sonar and um, yeah, well, let's let's just talk about that first. What what's the advantage of something so complicated as terrain relative navigation? Yeah, that's a, a a very good question. And so when we when we set out to design Orpheus, one of our our key drivers was uh, looking at every single component and asking ourselves, do we really need this? So when you put a vehicle into space, for example. Um, it's all governed by what they call the rocket equation, which basically boils down to the heavier it is, the more rocket fuel you need to shoot it off of, um, off of Earth and get it into space. So we wanted to kind of pare everything down as much as possible. And so when you do that, you want to look at how you can leverage uh, single components for multiple uses. And we knew that we would always want a camera uh, taking video on Orpheus, taking uh, photos. That's one of the main drivers for science is having visual feedback that scientists can look at um, to provide context, uh, et cetera. And so with a small, uh, cheap camera, we have machine vision cameras are, you know, on the order of seven, eight hundred dollars uh, on there. We can use that to do all of our uh, sort of localized navigation. It is by no means a complete navigation solution, um, but once it is well calibrated to give us quantitative results, uh, we can operate just by seeing the seafloor with something that's already on there. Acoustics themselves are uh, generally much heavier than cameras and also much more expensive. And when you're working in the Hadal zone, a lot of these uh, things like sonars and um, acoustic transducers um, that we take for granted in, uh, say, 6,000 meters and shallower aren't commercially available off-the-shelf products. So we would have to independently develop each one of those in order to um, get them working. And that has reliability concerns. And also, if you're developing a bespoke component, it's tremendously expensive. So all of those factors sort of uh, came in together um, to drive us towards visual navigation. In the future, we will need to use some acoustics as well. So we're not like abandoning that completely, but in order to sort of know where Orpheus is in like a global coordinate system, um, which is called like geodetic nav, uh, we will need some sort of acoustic beacon that we can then range to from the ship in order to know this is the GPS point of this. And then Orpheus with its uh, visual navigation can drive around there knowing, oh, I've traveled 10 kilometers this way you know, 500 meters this way, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So does the incorporation of, of terrain relative navigation present a different sort of controls problem than just using our traditional method or is it just bringing the data, data in from a different, of a different type from a, from a different source? So terrain relative navigation probably has uh, its best analogy to uh, what other vehicles use uh, in uh, DVLs, Doppler velocity logs. And so those are acoustic based systems that basically point down at the seafloor and they have four heads and they bounce the sound back and they get the returns. And through the software, it uh, can track, you know, if this, if this beam is returning faster then you're closer on this and you're moving that way. And so that's, that's the way things like Jason and Sentry and Alvin um, do their navigation now. And so we're essentially doing basically the same thing, but instead of using sound, we're using uh, imagery. Tim, I know we've talked about this in the past about how small of a, of a sub aerial extent the Hadal zone accounts for in the ocean. Mm. So, you know, What's what's so special about it? Why and you know why do you why do you approach it as a as an oceanographic problem and as an exploration problem? Well, you know, as an evolutionary biologist, I mean, trying to 
some of the greatest discoveries we've ever made are, are those that, that discover novel adaptations in the deep sea. The discovery of hydrothermal vents, the animals that live there, for example, you know, the, the, the evolution of new hemoglobin types in, in, a, in a riftia tube or an event, you know, spark so many lines of, of, of science, even in even medical science. And so, you know, first and foremost, there's half of the ocean depth we can't get to and can't know about. You know, in this few samples we have had, we now know that the halo zone is unlike the rest of the ocean. It can't be considered almost part of the rest of the ocean. The, the, the organic matter that, that falls from the surface of the ocean, when it gets to about halfway down, that's 5,000 meters, there's about 0.01% of that organic material left. Once it gets to the halo zone and the full ocean depth at 11 kilometers, there should be nothing there. But we know now well from our, you know, optimistic sam sampling that there's a tremendous amount of organic material there. It's on the, there's, there's activity down there on microbes on the order of, of, of shallow water coral reefs. So there's, there's a whole different um, ecosystem, I guess, landscape there to begin with. And then there's those novel adaptations I mentioned. We've been able to capture the deepest living fish and bring it up and sequence the genome of that fish. Now, fish around the world have about four or five genes that account for the integrity of a cell membrane. Right? We all have cell membranes and how, strength, how strong they are, how flexible they are. All those characteristics are, 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 are formed by four genes. And with the snailfish, you see the picture here on the bottom. It's, it's a deepest living fish, a liparid snailfish. They've got over 12 genes that, that, that code for strengthening or the integrity of cell membranes. They have biomolecules they produce that actually are novel in that they hold water into individual cells so that the proteins can function. So the proteins can function that as opposed to being squished by all the pressure. And so we've got human problems. We've got human diseases like Alzheimer's where cells don't operate right. The proteins don't operate correctly. And it's, 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 it's analogous to what we see or would see in, in fish in the Hadal zone. And so the fish have figured out, for example, how to maintain the integrity of a cell. If we can learn how to do that, we can apply that to human diseases, whether it's Alzheimer's, macular degeneration, liver disease, all these things have problems with protein function and cell issues. So not to mention just understanding academically how life has evolved in our deep sea. I felt we're seeing now that individual trenches have their own signature of life in them, their own set of species. They're closely related to other trenches often, but we, we see that they're maybe evolving in situ in isolation in these trenches. Those are, those are key places for us to go to understand how evolution works on Earth, so we might understand how it works on other ocean worlds. I mean, so the, so the, I don't know, the impact of studying the Halo Zone, I think, reverberates out, ripples out into so many different disciplines. Um, it's truly an exciting place to go. Okay, now let's bring it back to the mandate for, for the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute which is uh, to ex explore, study, characterize the US EEZ. Tell me about what the, the, the hadal zones within the US EEZ and, and um, how these might differ from one another and what you might expect to find there. That's interesting. So, you know, we, the US EEZ is, is about as large as the landmass of the, of the US as a lot large area, but we have the, the Puerto Rico trench is in, is in the US EEZ and the, the Aleutian Trench off Alaska is in the US EEZ. Um, and so there, there are, you know, how they differ, you ask me and I could say, well, I don't really know yet because we haven't really explored the Aleutian <laughs> Trench yet. I don't know if it's a trick question, can or not, but, um, Sorry. <laughs> you know, so we've done some genetics. We've tried to identify how trenches may be different around the world. And we've done genetics on the animals we've recovered there. And they can be vastly different. We think they look the same. In other words, they're cryptic species. They look the same, like the, the worms or the, the, the mussels or whatever, and they're completely different species. And so it looks like they've had a common origin around trenches around the world, and now they're diversifying. But I think that what we'll see, that the Puerto Rico trench history has, has a different history than does the Aleutian trench history. So the geologic history, the history of subduction, one plate going underneath another that forms a trench, is going to inform... The, the chemical composition of the rocks, the types of rocks that are there. Um, yeah, uh, and so it's gonna make a big, a big difference of where the setting is. But the reality is, is that we were, I'm supposed to be joining the Atlantis 
tomorrow to go dive in the Puerto Rico Trench to learn what's there and learn about that transition zone between 6,000 meters and 7,000 meters where things, everything seems to change. And so no matter what trench we go to, we see that as a commonality, which I think is really important. You asked about the differences, but there's also commonality. And, and so whether it's microbes, the community structure that's there, who we see there, or whether it's mm -hmm. fish, you know, or, or, or um, crustaceans, they all seem to change at 6,000 meters. And we just don't know why that is. We're really hoping to get at that question with this. Yeah, yes. and I think, you know, in addition, one of the commonalities is uh, from the hazards perspective is, you know, the, all the trenches are the primary sources of mega thrust er earthquakes, which are also pl primary uh, uh, drivers of tsunamis. And, you know, certainly the Puerto Rico trench, as, as we were studying down here with when we were down here with Alvin, I looked into the research and there was a, a tsunami caused by a part of the uh, by an earthquake in the uh, in the Puerto Rico trench in 1918 that killed 100 people in Puerto Rico. You know, so that that threat exists. You know, Aleutia Trench, of course, you know, we know about it in the Indian Ocean from from past experience. Um, you know, Casey, I want to jump over to you. Mm, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just going to say at the same time, why they all yeah. share this earthquake, you know, phenomena. That means there's also likely seeing a lot of cracking that's going on at depth. Yes. At those depths, cracking of the crust, letting water flow in, interacting with that fresh rock that's just been cracked, leaching nutrients into that water, and those nutrients are available then to life, just like it vents in hydrocarbon seeps. And that's why I really think that they're, and we think the fauna are going to be different depending on what trench you're in. It's going to be super exciting uh, once we get down there. Casey, I want to jump over to you for a, a, a question that, that Adam posed is, can Orpheus communicate with the surface? How do you know what it, that it's doing what it's supposed to do? And then I might add, um, can you retask it? So um, one thing I always like to say about autonomous vehicles is they're very good at doing what you tell them to do, not what you want them to do. Um, so as of, as of right now, we don't have any communications link to Orpheus uh, sub C, and that was a, a deliberate design choice that we made. Um, and our, our rationale behind that was that if you have lots of, um, lots of vehicles going down and ability to kind of have higher quantity of attempts at the seafloor at many dives over the course of a cruise, that if uh, one of them may go astray, then that's fine. You just sort of have enough, uh, enough backup dives versus if you went out with one single one, you need a lot more ability to retask on the fly. And there are a lot of Huey vehicles that have this really powerful uh, capability of doing acoustics uh, and they can, you know, actively, uh, reprogram on the fly, get feedback. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of sort of boundary pushing uh, innovation that happened on this last uh, OECI uh, cruise out on the Nautilus with uh, the Nereid under ice vehicle that did this through both acoustic and optical means, which was uh, definitely pushing, pushing the envelope there. Um, but for Hadal depths, it becomes uh, much more difficult to do these long distance acoustics. Uh, and it's just sort of a geometry and sort of how much sound power you put through the water. Uh, and so our decision was to kind of keep it simple. And right now there are no, uh, there are no acoustics on, um, on Orpheus that sort of communicate back at all. And that's sort of one of the reasons we can be, you know, cheap and accessible. Uh, so, Given all this, what's the typical, what's a potential dive duration for Orpheus or Eurydice? Yeah, so um, I think our our mission profile is that we probably spend anywhere between four and eight hours on the seafloor um, per vehicle. And uh, the overall dive length depends on your depth. So going down to say 11 kilometers, it takes six or seven hours to sink down. And when we uh, when we descend or ascend, we do so passively. So we, we carry a weight with us and then we drop the weight and then we'll float back up. So that way we're not using any of our precious battery power um, that's better spent exploring the seafloor. So six to eight hours, but with a the vision of having a fleet of these, you can have basically sort of around the, around the clock seafloor presence. So if you have six vehicles and they can all overlap by a couple of hours, now all of a sudden you're always on the seafloor and instead of 
sending acoustic data back up um, and retasking, you're downloading the data each time each new vehicle comes back up. And as we get smarter with having the vehicles communicate to each other sub C, it could be that one of the Orpheus vehicles basically, you know, talks to all yeah. the other ones and say, hey, hey, what's the cool things you found? They'll send it to one, that one comes back up and uh, we communicate that way too. So there's lots of cool design space to play with when you start doing lots of smaller vehicles. All right, cool design space. I'm gonna switch to eDNA. Uh, the Deep Green had a question about um, uh, eDNA and in that sample payload, would an eDNA sampler just be something, or an eDNA um, sensor be something that is just collecting sample for analysis later, or could you potentially work that into the control system and allow the vehicle to make decisions based on what it's, it's finding in the water? Yes. So, I mean, I, I can feel part of that. And go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, so, I, want that, I wanted both of you to ta yeah, tackle yeah. that one. Um, As so we're both kind of like, yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, that, that's sort of, that's kind of, to me, the, the holy grail in, in robotics, right? Is that kind of adaptive sampling where uh, you have like the science and the engineering working together in that the science is informing decisions that the vehicle is making. And you can do all sorts of things like make a vehicle that's curious and react to it temperature, chemical things, eDNA things. And so the hooks are there in in the vehicle. Um, and you always kind of have to be careful of how many inputs you put into a control system. As you know, as we talked about before, robots are very good at doing what you tell them, not what you want them to do. Um, but there's no reason that an in situ sampler couldn't inform the vehicle. And I mean, this is another thing that you can do visually too, right? We could go, if we have a sediment sampler on the vehicle, we don't wanna to try to take a sediment sample on top of a whole bunch of rocks that we won't get sediment from. So you can look, process those images and say, this is an area where we will probably get a good sample and then have Orpheus land there. So you can sort of use the vehicle to set yourself up to take better samples because in the past, the way that we've done this is just, you throw a, a sort of immobile lander and wherever it lands, that's where you get your set of data and your sample. Sometimes you get good ones, sometimes you don't. Orpheus kind of takes that to the next level. I don't know if you want to speak Well, no, this is, um, yeah, in the sense that I want to speak to adaptive sampling, and then I think that there will be a, a phased way of approaching it. Uh, and that is sort of with this in-situ chemical sensor that we have, if we can pipe that data into the computer and it says, if I ever see a hydrogen sulfide level above X, then I want you to turn around and keep following that gradient, keep following the, you know, do the grid pattern, find the highest signal and go find it again and sit down and then do some other work. I think that'll be sort of the first step. Uh, with regard to eDNA, I feel like, you know, we can sit there and talk about, well, we want eDNA, eDNA from an, an anoxic area. So it's some low oxygen area that the vehicle could sense that, you know, now basically integrate that in the, in the control system and then have it go back and turn the sampler on. That's not diff that won't be as difficult to do, easy for me to say. But that's I think that's the next step for the eDNA sensor as well. Yeah. But, but I, it's, I it's saw time, in the at the same time, Kim. We're I mean beyond eDNA, we're looking at trying to put genomics on the seafloor as well, right? We're trying to look oh, at yeah. things and see what we can probe. You think about what NASA would want to do on ocean worlds. Are there nucleic acids there? Are there amino acids there? So in the fundamental elements of life we want to be able to, to not only detect, but analyze with this vehicle. I, I, I saw in the private chat that we have behind the scenes that Rick Murray is still on the line. I thought he was going to, he's a busy guy. I thought he was going to go off and, and do other things when we finish with him. But he said he might have something to add about geographic priorities. So if we can bring him back. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I would like to I add, follow in on this. Um, yeah. You know about the geographic priorities. Tim answered it a little bit, but uh, in the context of Hadel Zone, and as did you. But the exclusive economic zone of the United States is the OECI's target area, because NOAA, NSF, NASA, and other agencies, of course, are U.S. government monies funded by the largesse of the American taxpayers. And so we uh, are fulfilling the nation's need to explore this economic zone. And it is a huge area, as Tim said. It's you know, roughly scale of the continental and other land-based sides of the of the United States. And just go back to those pictures that Tim had of little tiny Orpheus flying around down there. And through the 
you know, many years of work by our colleague Bob, Bob, Bob Ballard and the Ocean Exploration Trust with their cutting edge vehicles, Tim and Casey and their vehicles and other vehicles as well. It's still a huge area that's unexplored that we have no uh, knowledge about. So yes, the Aleutians and with that is certainly in our exclusive economic zone. And also the economic zone is 200 miles offshore or around any little tiny island out in the Pacific. So, yep. you know, an island that might be 200 acres in size and you draw a circle with a radius of 200 nautical miles all around it. That's a huge area. And there's dozens, if not hundreds of those out there. So it's a huge area and uh, the ocean is vast. Our instruments are small. And these AUVs and ROVs, they help us expand the footprint of the, of the research vessel. So we're able to explore out in a wider area than just immediately underneath the large research ship up top. And that's the wave of the future, expanding the footprint of the vessel, going after that huge area that is so unexplored, even by these creations of these brilliant engineers like Ballard and his team and Casey and Tim and and others. It's it's a remarkable challenge, uh, but we're up to it. All right. Um, jumping off from that idea of it's the wave of the future, Tim and Casey, what's next? I, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, uh, <laughs> I guess, the practical side. So uh, the next steps for Orpheus are um, whenever you take things out uh, to the sea, you discover um, things that need improvement, problems, issues. Uh, so we have um, a set of next steps that we basically call sort of a transition to operation. So we've developed the vehicle. We know the core concepts and the core systems work well and as uh, intended. So we need to uh, do some engineering to make sure those are sort of robust and reliable. Um, as Tim had mentioned before, mm -hmm. in, start integrating all of these cool puzzle pieces that we have with the train relative visual navigation, um, with uh, things about uh, working in adaptive sampling, all of those things, start integrating all that together so that uh, we're, we're no longer doing tech demonstrations with Orpheus. We're doing uh, missions that speak to these priorities of exploration and characterization of uh, the Hadal zone. And so from an engineering perspective, that is the driver for what we're doing. Um, and getting ready, sort of hardening ourselves uh, so we can deal with Hadal zone pressures. And then I think also with that comes then expanding out into this great vision of what the science priorities are for expanding and exploration, right? Right, absolutely. And so the, those lead us to try to characterize the, the environment there. So that's the that's the chemical sensors, that's the biological sensors, that's the maps that we'll make to look at the distribution uh, abundance and, uh, of life that's there. Um, that's one of the key priorities of, of the OECI too, to look at biodiversity. Uh, on the seafloor, uh, especially in our EEZ, to see what resources we have. You know, there's a lot of scientists that want to that want to put down ocean bottom seismometers in the trenches, and I can see that oh, it would be a vehicle to deploy those things, frankly, and recover them. And so it branches out into other disciplines of science other than just biology in mind. So, um, you know, I I see that as as they've been working on the core vehicle, I have been trying to get the instrumentation together that will get us ready to so that when we go to the Lucian Trench, let's say in 2023. We're, we're ready to go with the instruments that we need. Uh, and so that means engaging a lot of engineers and other scientists. And so it's it's been exciting that way. But I think we'll see eDNA collectors. I think we'll see in situ chemical sensors. Uh, I think we'll see different kinds of camera systems on the vehicle, um, methane sensors. Um, those are the key things. And I think we're gonna see, for me, is sampling the sediment. It's getting those sediment cores. because. It's the interdisciplinary thing that happens when you sample sediments because there's microbiologists that gain, there's there's myofaunal, macrofaunal, megafaunal scientists that gain. There there are the poor water chemists that, that gain. I mean, there's a nexus of a sample and it is the coring system. And that's why it's one of the highest priorities for the vehicle uh, next, as Casey knows. It's working on how to do that best. An automated sediment coring device uh, that also has in it the electrodes that we use in the Institute chemical sensor so we can sense the chemistry inside of those cores that we're going to take. And it, I think people don't, I don't think they understand the level of biodiversity we're talking about too in these places. And if I took a coffee cup and put it in, dipped it into the halo sediment, I could see 150 species, just 50 species of nematode worms uh, alone. And so 
there's a lot to do and to correlate that with the organic material that's there and knowing, understanding where the organic material is coming from. That's a huge question that we have. So science wise, you know, we're, lock, we're in lockstep with the core vehicle functionality and trying to make sure we integrate as we go along. Make no small plans. They have no magic. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I have been told that we have, we have had our technical issues remedied. Um, but uh, before we play that, I'm going to throw it back to Aurora to wrap things up. And then we'll play us out with the, uh, the video that, that lays out the vision for these, these the beginnings of, of, of this, hopefully, constellation of vehicles that is based on Orpheus and Eurydice. So thank you very much. And back over to you, Aurora. I would like to thank our hosts for today from Woods Hole Oceanographic and all of our speakers, especially Rick, Tim, and Casey for giving us a glimpse into their work. On behalf of the guests today, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us to learn more about the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. I'd also like to thank all of our OECI partners and NOAA collaborators who make this work possible, especially the University of Rhode Island's Inner Space Center who produced this webinar. This webinar was the fifth in a six part series highlighting the amazing work of OECI. If you've missed any of the previous programs, they are linked along with upcoming webinars at the site down below. I hope that you'll join us for the next and final session on December 15th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. The next webinar will be titled Volcanoes Under the Sea and Exploring 53% of U.S. Waters that Remain Unmapped. This will be presented live from aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. That will be hosted by OECI partner, University of Rhode Island. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope to see you next time.